Well, hello there, and welcome to Food Lab Talk. I am your host, Michael Bakker, an expert in creating win-win partnerships. Utilize this passion and skill to educate, inspire, and support future generations. Not only are these some of the words that have been shared about this week's guest, they are what I consider trademarks of a change maker. You must be in the arena. You must be willing to roll up your sleeves and do the hard work. You must be so bold to imagine a world you hope to see and then take the steps to make it a reality. I am honored to be joined by Stephen Ritz for today's episode. Stephen is a man that needs a little introduction. You may be familiar with his signature cheese hat and Green Bronx Machine t-shirts. His organization, Green Bronx Machine, builds healthy, equitable, and resilient communities through inspired education, local food systems, and 21st century workforce development. Using a school-based model, the Green Bronx Machine is inspiring healthy students and healthy schools, transforming communities that are fragmented and marginalized into neighborhoods that are inclusive and thriving. Stephen, welcome to the show. Happy to have you here. Honored and delighted. What a privilege, and this will certainly be a pleasure. So what's with the hat, Stephen? Well, I am, after all, the big cheese. But, you know, the hat is, is symbolic. It's symbolic of a lot of things. First and foremost, it's symbolic of the name that the kids gave me, the big cheese, when I was 330 pounds long before you knew me and walking around drinking four 44-ounce sodas a day and eating extra pizza with extra cheese. So literally, I was the big cheese. When I started farming, I wore a farm hat, which I hated. Went to visit a friend, Will Allen in Wisconsin, who invited me out to learn what an acre of land is, because I had never seen an acre of land. I had seen a city street, but never an acre of land. Got off the plane in Kenosha, Wisconsin, saw the cheese hat, said, that's a perfect fit. And I've been wearing it ever since. And to this day, I've been wearing, I've, I've taken over 1 million pictures of children with this cheese hat. But, you know, the cheese hat is absolutely emblematic of the fight. The fight for children who don't have, the fight for children who are born in places that most people would not want to be caught dead in, and the fight for equity, justice, and inclusion for communities like mine. So be careful with a man with a yellow hat. I've worn it around the world, and I'm going to keep wearing it until I drop dead. All right, Big Cheese, let's go back in history. So tell me a little bit more, because the audience might not know what, what the Green Bronx Machine is all about, and your story. So go back in time, once upon a time. Ooh, let me wave the magic wand. Uh, so I'm a little bit older than I look. I never intended to be a teacher or an educator or a food advocate, if that's what people want to call me. But I've always been an equity warrior, no matter what I was doing. You know, I, I was born advocating. Let me tell you that much. But my plan was to be in the NBA. The Knicks just didn't figure it out in the line with me. I'm still available. But, you know, if someone knows someone, please have them give me a call. Long made short, I got into public education and found that I was really had a talent for it at a time when no one did in the early 80s in the middle of the South Bronx, when the cocaine, the crack and Sadly, the AIDS crisis was just blossoming everywhere. And if people remember what the South Bronx looked like in the 80s, it was rough. And then, you know, life happens. You start teaching. I had a great run as a teacher, had some tragedy in my own life, lost some students. And then Lizette and I lost our son before birth and then another child after birth. And um, I wound up taking a job just closest to home to circle the wagons around my immediate family if you will. So I just, you know, picked the closest job availability and lo and behold, found myself at the most dysfunctional high school in all of New York City. Some context, it was a school with a 17% graduation rate. So imagine, you know, 48 school safety agents, 18 armed police officers. And I walked in and they're like, oh, you get along great with everybody. We're going to give you the, the worst kids. And I'm like, the worst kids, which I hate that term, are usually the best kids. So I inherited 17 overage, undercredited young men and women who came out of prison, and I was told to teach them science. If you can add in a soundtrack, think of Thomas Dolby. Blinded me with science. I, you know, I never taught science in my life. You know, I had no idea what science was. Um, but I was like, okay, I, I'll try it. First thing I do, I put out a frantic call on the internet to all my friends, help, I'm asked to teach science. 
Send me a microscope, a test tube, something. There were no supplies, nothing. And I uh, heard nothing. You know, the internet wasn't working. Al Gore was on strike. Six weeks into the class, I get this announcement. Mr. It's come to the principal's office. And what I had done so far is really done a great job of engaging these young people. They were really showing up. They felt valued. We had a sense of community. Show up at the principal's office. And there's a huge box on the principal secretary's desk. And I'm like, this is great. Someone heard my prayers. I rip open the box like a kid on Christmas morning. And inside the box are these onions. And I'm like, WTF. And that's not, wow, that's fantastic. It was quite the literal WTF. I'm like, what are these things? The kids are going to kill me. And like a dejected dog, I walk back to class, take this box, throw it behind an old radiator behind a window and forgot about it. Turns out one day there is a fight in the class. Skitty little kid goes and makes a joke about a girl's mother. Girl gets up to hit him. And I'm like, my career is over. The little guy goes running over the under the radiator and comes up with a hand of flowers. And I'm like, flowers? Where'd these come from? Turns out those onions were actually flower bulbs. And the heat and the steam and the sun behind the radiator forced them. So in this incredibly violent, turbulent moment, it was science and, you know, a teachable moment. I open up the box and start reading, which I should have done. And turns out my students and I were invited to come plant these bulbs as part of a project in the local neighborhood. Well, fast made forward, that year, my students and I planted 25,000 bulbs across New York City to commemorate 9-11 in parks everywhere. We got invited to City Hall. I made the kids dress up. They thought those kids were the honor students and wanted to offer them scholarships. And I realized that, wow, you could do amazing things with children if you just plug them in. Turned out those 17 young people graduated high school, which is remarkable. None went back to prison. They became the building block of Sustainable South Bronx, which is a nationally recognized nonprofit. And many of them went on to do environmental remediation work, particularly after Hurricane Katrina. So talk about a full virtuous circle. And I started this program after school with young people who were disinterested in environmental remediation. Green roofs, green walls. You know, Mayor Bloomberg came and gave buildings tax credits for having sedum on top of roofs. So I had this incredible workforce of young people. And wow, we were just determined to do as much work as possible. And I always say, you know, don't talk to me about education if you don't talk to me about opportunity, because it has to translate into living wage. So long made short, you know, we started doing gardens, ornamental gardening work. And I started placing kids in employment. Whole Foods hired my kids. Turns out the first Whole Foods in New York City invited me and my gang kids to come down and literally started converting from going just, you know, ornamental stuff and landscape to fresh fruits and vegetables. And we took over a plot of land in the Bronx that's now six acres long and built out the largest organic farm in the Bronx and started donating food to others because all of our kids resonated with the notion of ending hunger. But wouldn't you know, Whole Foods decided to give us a stand in Whole Foods. And, you know, it became a profitable little entity. So these kids really went from selling little things in plastic bags that grew somewhere else for no margin, for big margin in Whole Foods and got excited. And then we bumped into Viraj Puri at Gotham Greens and got invited to visit Gotham Green. And that was the game changer. Viraj inspired us. We started doing some indoor gardening. Uh, my students and I went on to win the National Indoor Gardening Championship in San Francisco. I showed up with 17 kids only to find out it was the marijuana show. Kids thought I was the coolest teacher in the world. Didn't lose my job, but I learned about indoor farming and other technology and started doing vertical farming with Tower Garden. You know, along the way, I had a heart attack due to my obesity, was hospitalized, was 330 pounds and was eating myself sick and diseased. And then just realized, wow, this wasn't sustainable. If I'm talking about growing food, maybe I should eat it. Lost 110 pounds simply eating the food that I grew with kids in school. We started feeding the school regularly, launched the number one school garden to school cafe program, and then decided I wanted to scale this. Funny thing, I'm having a conversation with you. Mindful Google knows a thing or two about scaling. Wanted to keep it smart, small, manageable, replicable. And we took a class in 2013 in Hunts Point, and that class earned $3 million in college scholarship money. And here we are today. I've turned that moment into a movement. So I like to say Green Bronx Machine grows vegetables, our vegetables grow students, our students grow schools, and our schools grow communities. Wow. How do you respond to that? 
So Stephen, I've known you now for quite a while. If I think about your work, you do so many things concurrently. Was it for you ultimately a way to connect with the students that you found in your high school? Or was it ultimately the combination of that, your own heart attack, and it all came together? From what is ultimately was the, the driving force behind the Green Bronx machine? And when you say today, the Green Bronx machine stands for X, is it about engaging kids? Is it about shifting diets? Where would you land with an answer with a question like this? Good question. So first and foremost, you know, Green Bronx Machine is about equity. It's about equity and access. That's what it's really about. It's the belief that we are all Americans. It was born out of the belief that we can move people who are traditionally apart from success to becoming a part of it in ways that benefit 100% of society. I just along the way figured out that the greatest thing that's non-negotiable in society is food. So we put food right in the middle of it, you know, because food is responsible for so much and is something that is absolutely near and dear to everyone. So that, that, that's where I would put it. But, you know, when I want people to think of Green Bronx Machine, I want them to think of high performing public schools and happy, healthy children. That's what I want them to think about. I want them to think about democratized access to education, to resources, to opportunity. When people think about Green Bronx Machine, I want them to realize that we are the ones that we are waiting for, that locally grown solutions augmented by the private sector are the greatest drivers for personal transformational change. So let me be clear, the most important school supply in the world is food. So in terms of this podcast and food and change makers, everything that happens in school is related to food. You know, kids come to school hungry, they can't perform. They're malnourished, they can't perform. They're given poison, and we, we wonder why they freak out in the classrooms. So food is the most important school supply in the world. Children will never be well-read if they're not well-fed. So the biggest equalizer, if you will, to facilitating high-performing public schools where kids aren't sick, where kids aren't obese, where they're not having all these food-related diseases and disorders, is food, simply put. On your journey, Stephen, so far, you started in your own classroom, your own high school. But from there, it went from one classroom, one high school, to now a much broader organization. Tell me a little bit about that journey. Oof. You know, I never expected it. And let me be clear. I've been asked to graduate and work elsewhere. So, and, and those were forces not put on me. But, you know, again, I fight for the underdog. I believe I answer to a much higher moral authority. And, you know, that's, that's my conscience. So I'm going to do what's in the best interest of children. There are teacher advocates. There are principal advocates. There are unions. I'm president of the Children's Union. Let me be clear. If it's good for children and good for community, I'm standing up for that first and foremost. And I also think there are a million people like me waiting to be born. They're just afraid. And, you know, listen, I've been hurt along the way. I've been hurt personally. Financially, I took a huge hit and I'm, I'm not complaining. You know, there are certain things that people want. But in order to make dramatic change, you have to be prepared to make a sacrifice. And along the way, I have. And, you know, I feel that the paycheck that I get is bigger than, than any performance bonus anyone could ever give me. Now, the flip side is I'm getting great offers from private industry and private schools, and I figured out how to take that private school model and kind of make it into a Tom's buy one, get one free. So that adds value for everybody. But, you know, you've got to put your stake in the ground somewhere. And this work is hard, and it requires a lot of courage, to be sure. The work you do requires a lot of courage. But the opposite of courage isn't cowardice. The opposite of courage is conformity, because even a dead fish can go with the flow. And I am no dead fish. I'm going to swim. You're going to swim. We're going to keep getting upstream until we spawn. And I find those amazing people and those amazing opportunities that just give me one more hop. That's what it's all about. You know, for far too long, people have gotten fat off the dysfunction of communities like mine. Many people are well-intended, but they are thriving while our community is barely surviving. And, and we need to flip that script and flip that ownership. Let's talk a little bit about other change makers. So what I heard you say is that there might be a million people out there, but there might be hesitance. There might be some fear. So as you have so successfully scaled 
your model to from just you being in your own classroom and doing your amazing stuff to it now being actually utilized around the world. For the million people out there that are potential change makers, what are some of the lessons that you have learned that are transferable to the other million people for them to get going as well? Showing up is very powerful. Let me be clear. You've been here. You see how the children love me. You see how they love Lizette. They know we are going to be here. And consistency makes a difference. Now, some of the small things, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. I think the only thing I'm really good at is showing up and being positive and putting my best foot forward. But that in itself becomes a contagion effect. So be prepared to be hurt. But that's okay. Every no gets you closer to a greater yes. And you just have to show up. Every drop fills the cup. Find heroes that you can believe in and celebrate the successes. Yeah. But what about this courage component? How do you instill more courage or a greater appetite for risk taking for those who are on the sideline as of today? Listen, uh, I'm looking at you. You've taken a lot of risks. You understand what those risks are. And probably in some ways, in more real terms than I do, you've got to be accountable financially. You've got all sorts of compliance issues. You're in a workplace. I'm just here to shape and motivate minds. And you know what happens is when you get people kind of thinking the same way, they find their tribe. And the cool thing about finding their tribe is that those tribes grow. And, you know, if I gave you a box of 100 marbles and said, oh, Michael, pick out the one purple marble, you know, you could sit there and go marble at a time. Oh, white marble, I wish you were the purple marble, but you're not. You know, or you could just keep going until you find another purple marble. So I want kids to find purple marbles. And they find themselves in the beauty of the age that we are living in now with all its complexities is that we are both hyper-local and hyper-connected. You can find your purple marbles as long as you're willing to live your values. So know where you stand. Put your stake in the ground and then circle people around you. Don't be afraid to take risks. You know, look, and they say, if people were afraid to take risks, we'd have a faster horse and that's about it, you know? Understood. Back to getting each to each vegetables. So, you know, it's quite easy to say when kids don't like vegetables, they like the sweet stuff. You're proving that it's not true. So talk to me a little bit more about how do you get kids to eat vegetables, one, and then two, do they continue to eat vegetables after they leave your classroom? You know, look, again, I didn't even know what vegetables were before I got involved with Green Bronx Machine, to be very clear. I think Ronald Reagan said ketchup was a vegetable, if I'm not mistaken. And that was probably, you know, I, I did eat a lot of pizza, hence the hat. But I think kids know what they are exposed to. So if kids grow kale and they taste kale, they eat kale. Similarly, if they grow crap and they get crap, they eat crap. So exposing children to healthy, fresh food, getting them a taste for that at a young age is absolutely critical. And that epiphany happened to me after I was 50 that, you know, it's just easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. So while I was doing great work with overage and undercredited kids, you know, I probably could have kept half of them out of the situation that they were in if I had started at a younger age. So many kids come to school hungry. What if people knew that food could be grown right where they live? Now, the flip side with older people is, look, I meet a lot of people who don't like vegetables. Oh, I'm allergic to vegetables, but I've never met anybody who's allergic to money. And for the older people, when I talk about giving them a penny, a seed, and in 30 days having a $5 bill, that marketability that markup, if you will, that margin is a lot, is very attractive. And for the young kids, they really get excited. You've seen the excitement they have around lettuce, around kale. The cool thing is with a chef and some of the support that I've been getting from you guys, I can make anything taste delicious and have fun in the process. You just wave the magic wand. You know, that's, that's why we're here. We're the cheerleaders. We're not the sage on the stage. The internet's the sage on the stage right now. We're just the cheerleaders. We've got to make sure they're playing nicely in the box and giving them good orderly direction. It has been sad, Stephen, that you're an expert in creating win-win partnerships. You've had great success bringing together community stakeholders to inspire action and to create change. Besides your personality, and it's hard, really, really hard to say no to you, are there other secret ingredients that you have in creating win-win partnerships? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and listen, 
you know, my personality sometimes has worked to my detriment. So thank you for the compliment. But sometimes it works to my detriment, um, you know, because I am a big personality and it's not about the cult of me. It's really about the cult of pedagogy. So learning how to scale, looking successfully at businesses. But, you know, my dear friend, Dave Stangus, a long term sustainability champion. Everybody knows Dave. Dave, you know, I'm going to quote Dave. The big thing is what value are you bringing to stakeholders and shareholders? Because if you're not bringing value to stakeholders and shareholders, you're offering nothing. Now, for a long time, I saw a lot of nonprofits coming to communities like mine that are very well intended. They charge a ton of money. Their executive directors make a ton of money. It's their second and third go around in life. And not to say they're not doing wonderful things. They are. But they're making a whole lot of money off the dysfunction here and things don't change. It's annual fees. It's tiered subscriptions. So you got to be disruptive. How do you take that power and put it back in the community? And I feel my best advocate are children. Listen, if you think I'm charming, you met them. The kids are really charming. I'm going to, you know, create a whole generation of young people who no one's going to say no to and no one should say no to. You know, puppies and children, they go a long way with getting things to yes. But you've got to offer value for stakeholders. You've got to offer value for shareholders. You've got to really, you know, as much public speaking as I do, I'm really a public listener. And I listen to people's needs and say, how can I meet those needs? And not only meet those needs, but exceed their expectations, you know, and then under promise and over deliver. And that's what we've done consistently here. Talking about the schools and the impact you're making over there, school food in the U.S. probably has some opportunities. Of course. So when you think about your desire to make impact, have you over the course of your impact work, considered focusing more on, for example, changing the school food standards versus what you do? Have you had that consideration or has it always been you love what you do, you're very good at that, and you leave change in the standards of the school food to others? I don't leave anything to others. Let's be clear. I don't, I don't leave anything to others. But for me, I think standards don't change because people will get away with whatever they can. But when you create a better consumer, when you create a better client, when you have young people who are voting with their forks and voting with their mouths and voting with their wallets and saying, not on my shift, then you have real comprehensive change. So, you know, my war is just begun in some ways. So I would say I'm at the very nascent stage of my career. Right now, I have to be an advocate for children because people aren't willing to do it for free. I am. People aren't willing to give up their job, give up their pension, give up their security and come and fight for kids. I am. But, you know, the next round is going to be me being a policy wonk. So I have just gotten started. You know, I haven't announced my candidacy yet, but watch out for me to move into policy because the real answer here is policy. What we have allowed to happen is criminal. And, and it's largely because of lobbying. It's largely because of big business interests. It's largely because people in communities like mine can't vote, don't vote, are disenfranchised. But imagine when they are engaged in educated consumers. Now, I'll give you a couple of great points. You know, uh, I'm a huge advocate for Newman's Own. Great product. Let's talk about a product. When I started bringing in Newman's Own to and I imagine a company that exists to give 100% of profits away. Those are the things that we need to celebrate, particularly for communities like mine. So it wasn't enough for me to get support from Newman's Own Foundation. I wanted my students to buy Newman's Own products. So I started bringing in Newman's Own products and talking about Paul Newman. And you'll never believe who the children in the middle of the South Bronx thought Paul Newman was. My dad. They thought Paul Newman was my dad. He's an old white guy who also wears a hat and hangs out with kids. So Paul Newman is probably Mr. It's dad. And, you know, I had to explain who he was. I had to explain what his philosophy is, why he runs this company. If you look now, guess what my students are buying? Newman's own products because they realize they are supporting themselves. Listen, we can send our money and Ziploc little bags elsewhere, or we can make decisions that are better for us, better for our planet, and better for our community, one simple decision at a time. So I look for companies that continue to innovate, continue to thrive, continue to push the needle, and really talk about not only the triple bottom line, but the quintuple bottom line, people, planet, profit, progress, and purpose. Because now more than ever, people want to have purpose. Look at the work that we do together. Those are purpose-driven people who want to change the world. They're not, putting, they're not putting dollars first. 
They're putting purpose and progress first. And then how do we make it profitable? And, and, and that's part of my modus operandi here. Such a wonderful story, Stephen. So when you think now about the future of your organization, the Green Bronx Machine, what is needed for you to accelerate and to scale up the work that you're doing? So that's a great question. And we have a lot of answers. So you know, I need to let people know that sometimes people think this organization is much bigger than it is. This organization is me. I'm a volunteer. It's my wife who came from the corporate sector to kind of operationalize things and a part-time consultant and a whole lot of children and volunteers. That's it. There's no marketing. There's no media, nor should there be really. And what we are learning through organizations like yours is how to scale. You know, for a long time, people didn't want me around. So I never had to think about scaling. I just had to find a home. But now everybody wants us to be around. So we thought about scaling. The first thing we did is really focus on our curriculum. And we spent about two years designing curriculum that comes with no annual fees, no tiered subscription, is a lifetime site license, democratized access. We then thought about, well, how do you give teachers and people around the world the opportunity to engage with it? Unlimited professional development. So we spent our time doing that. Now, I'm a big believer in nail it before you scale it. And we have nailed it. We have proven that this program works. We have 700 schools across the country. Some of our most successful sites are schools that I've never even been to because we have put the information in people's hands. We've given them access and we've democratized it in a way that really works. Now, I need some help with technology, you know, but there's an answer for that. There are people who can do that. But there is now an almost insatiable appetite for what we're doing and what we're doing works. You know, I'm so proud. You're going to meet a kid uh, on October 9th who built a DoorDash delivery service out of his wheelchair with an application. We have young people who will be the first in their family to attend private high school, much less graduate and go to college. We've gotten kids into some of the best high schools and colleges in the nation. We have a young man we're celebrating who has a 4.0 at the University of Texas in Austin. He's like a computer geek. I can't wait to have him back. So these are the successes that we celebrate, you know, in each and every day. Through this door walks the next Barack Obama, the next Sonder Sotomayor. And it's my job to make sure that they are fueled for success. And it's my job to make sure that people have access, teachers have access. They don't have to get fired. They don't have to complain. That we can partner with organizations like Whole Kids Foundation and Newman's Own to really create successful models that live into perpetuity and that really benefit both the funding organization and the communities, not only just on the philanthropic side, but on the health side. You know, you've got to put your stake in the ground and say what you mean and mean what you say and stop celebritizing food and really create the next generation of heroes. And you know who those heroes are? Our students. And that's why we launched this campaign called Be Your Own Hero. So these kids can grow up and be themselves. That's what I want. I want belief agency and identity. I want kids to be proud of who they are, where they are, no matter what they are and what they do. And that's what this work is about. And kids who can grow their own food and feed their communities or bring something home for grandma or do something nice for the homeless tend to feel good about the work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we have a program here where we have our third and fourth graders growing prescriptive greens, microgreens, for seniors who are food insecure and recovering from cancer. And these kids can't wait to deliver that food to those seniors. And those seniors and those children realize that food is medicine. That's the kind of connection here in communities that's priceless. You know, it's the work we love to do. So wonderful, Stephen. So if you knew then what you know now as it relates to change making, what would you share with your younger version? Oh, great question. You know, it takes what it takes. So let me be clear about that. You know, like anything, it takes what it takes. Would I have preferred not to put my wife and my daughter through the anxiety of seeing me, you know, near death in the hospital? For sure. But, you know, it takes what it takes. And I'm glad I've come out on the other side. I probably would have gotten fired sooner. You know, for a long time, I fought the fight and tried to play within the line. So I probably would have gotten fired sooner from some of the jobs that I had because sometimes you just don't play nice and, and, you know, you could walk away instead of trying to fit. You know, I'm a firm believer that one size does not fit all and sometimes you can't force a fit. But, you know, if you feel better about yourself and better about your convictions and have the conviction to go forth in life and do amazing things, you can get out of sticky situations sooner. Don't settle. Don't compromise. And, and that's what I tell kids all the time. And again, 
I had this wonderful conversation with my daughter. And, you know, I tell her, don't compromise on your principles. You know, don't be afraid to take a chance. Be cautious with your heart, but take big risks. You know, that's what life is about. You're young, you're beautiful. You can get up and dust yourself off and do it again. Be careful with your heart. Be careful with your health because those are irreplaceable. But everything else, you know, Amazon delivers in 24 hours. There's Prime. And, you know, you don't need that crap either. You'll find out how easy it is to live a life of abundance when you have a whole lot less. On that I note, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today on Food Lab Talk. It's been truly wonderful to learn more about your incredible work and thoughts. Good luck with what is ahead of you. Thank you kindly. I can't believe it's over already. Looking back at my conversation with Stephen, a few things stood out for me. First, don't just be a public speaker. Be a public listener. Listen to people's needs and consider how you can add value. Two, there is simply no substitute for passion and authenticity. When you speak with Stephen, you can feel the passion and enthusiasm radiating from him. It draws you in and it piques your interest. It reminds me of something Amy Keister said in season one of the podcast. People creating change are the ones we trust and follow. And on that note, a common theme from this season, and perhaps last season as well, is the theme of community and networks. It is not just what you know that will help you on your change-making journey, but who you can find to support you, embrace you, fund you, or work with you. I enjoyed Stephen's analogy of a fish swimming upstream, finding the most amazing people and opportunities that would give him just one more hop in the right direction. For more information about the Green Bronx Machine, be sure to check out the show notes. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to the podcast at foodlabtalk.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. As we close, I invite you to pursue your own bold vision and take whatever action you can take toward a better food system. See you next time.